Justice for mothers. Justice for all who mother. Putting in the care work mothers. Adoptive mothers. Adaptive mothers. Justice for mothers on the Zoom. Those still not in the room. Moms on the front line. Moms working overtime. Justice for the persistent. The consistent. The resilient. Let's see the strength she carries. Help her rise up. Justice for your mother. For your mother's mother. For the greats and the great greats. Justice for our future mothers. Because when mothers rise, they lift the world. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Paulette Senior and I am president and CEO of the Canadian Women's Foundation. And for 30 years, we have been Canada's foundation for gender equality. We support diverse women, girls, and gender diverse people to move out of poverty, out of violence, and into confidence and leadership. This is a very special edition, I'm so excited, of the Tireless Readers Collective because we're interviewing a mother and daughter, and all through the month of May, our Mother Rising campaign has been raising awareness about the challenges mothers and caregivers are facing because of the pandemic. So please visit the Mother Rising page on our website, to learn more, fill out survey about barriers you're facing and consider supporting this campaign if you can. Canadianwoman.org slash the Mother Rising. Now it's great here with two extraordinary women, Anita Felician and her mother, Kathy Felician Brown. They will join me on the screen momentarily. But I have been, you know, just looking forward to this chat for weeks. I have read uh, the book um, cover to cover, each and every word. I just like it just enveloped me. So I can't wait to actually talk with them about it. Um, but my mother's daughter um, and and this book, and I recommend it so highly and without reservation. In fact, I could barely put it down myself. So it's a memoir uh, by world champion and Olympic hurdler, Perdita Felicien. It goes back to before her athletic journey began, starting with her mother's early life growing up in St. Lucia and what brought her to Canada. The book takes us through their intertwined journeys, recounting the many obstacles Kathy, Padita, and their family overcame along the way, including racism, abuse, and homelessness. But before we move on to the interview, I want to acknowledge that today we are joining you from many different areas of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit land. I am joining you from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation and Williams Treaty signatories of the Mississauga and Chippewa nations known as Pickering, Ontario. I am grateful for the opportunity to meet and work on this land and I'm committed to pursuing truth, reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship in an ongoing effort to make right with all our relations. Now, just a quick note that if you run into any te technical difficulties or if we do, please stay with us. We will be right back. Also, if you see any sort of sketchy looking links in the comments, please do not click on them. We don't want you to miss a moment and we don't want you to get spammed. So something to look out for. And just a reminder that if you haven't entered the Canadian Women's Foundation prize draw to win one of three copies, so let me hold up my book because I'm so proud of this book. 
three copies of my mother's daughter, This Is Your Last Chance. So visit canadianwoman.org slash tireless readers collective and enter online now. So let's jump into the interview and I've got several questions of my own and you're welcome to post yours in the chat during the discussion. Then we'll leave some time uh, for your questions at the end. Um, so without any further delay, I'd like to now welcome Pradita and Kathy. Hello and welcome to you both. Hello, Paulette. You know, as you were talking, I'm like, you need to be the publicist for my book. You, along with Dan Collins, I think right now, would make a dynamic duo. I'm like, she's our biggest cheerleader. I just thank you for writing this book. Are you oh, kidding? I don't need to be a cheerleader because this book speaks for itself. So I'm so excited to get into it. And um, I, I love the feel of it, but I love the words inside even more. Thank so thank you both for joining us today um, and to talk about this book and your stories. So let's get right into the question. So we know the first part of, uh, of the book is Kathy's story as told by you, Pradita, and then the story moves into focusing on your rise as a world champion hurdler. So I'm curious about two things here. What conversations did you two have about sharing so much of your lives through so many ups and downs and did you have any specific hopes or any reservations in sharing your stories yeah do you want to take that first one or you want me i'll take it <laughs> so i first i always knew i wanted to write my mother's story because i knew it was remarkable and uh, i didn't know all of it so this is why this story really came about and i didn't start writing until i retired in 2013 uh, because I was no longer competing and I wasn't distracted by sport. So that could be my full focus now. But then in 2014, I brought my mother together because she was she was okay with it initially. But I wanted my entire family to give me their blessing in October of 2014. And so I was like, look, I am putting our family's life on the page. You know, all that we're West Indian and like a lot of cultures, you like airing the laundry, cleaning yep. the <laughs> like, what are you doing? And Every single family member, my sisters, my brother, their children, my mom especially, gave me their blessing because I also knew that like, I'm not telling um, like a sanitized version of our life. I'm telling the mm -hmm. truth of it. I'm giving, I'm revealing a lot. I'm also talking about, you know, things I didn't know about or I wasn't around to witness or see because I wasn't born yet. So that was, you know, conversation. Do you want to pick up about why you said yes <laughs> yeah i said yes because um when you asked me um i said yes because i wanted um women who been in abusive situation mm. know how how you know to get out of it to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. it is um being a, a, a abusive relationship it is not where a woman should be yeah. if a relationship is not working come out of it because we women, we were, we didn't born to get beaten by a man. Mm -hmm. we, we we were born to fall in love, have a good relationship, have a good life, have a family, mm -hmm. abuse, and that's what I was in, and that's where my message is coming. That you know that a woman should not stay in an abusive relationship. Yeah, you have mm -hmm. to come out. Yeah, if it's not working, come out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right. Thank you. And is there anything that you hoped for beyond that or had any reservations about? And I hear you with, you know, the Western and Caribbean thing, you don't air your dirty laundry, but your mm -hmm. honesty jumps off the page. But is there any specific thing that you wanted to um, to to hope that this book would bring about or uh, any sort of thing that you wanted to hold back? Yeah, that's a poignant question. And, um, you know, I'll be I'll be 100% transparent because that's all I know how to be, honestly, mm -hmm. is, you know, I knew the story was powerful, right? Because this young girl who's pregnant, has a one-year-old child at home at the same time, meets this, you know, affluent white family on the beach and gets herself to Canada. And I look at the, the, the legacy she's left. I look at the that I'm like, that story is so remarkable. I didn't know mm -hmm. all that I had to tell it. But yes, at times, I know growing up, like we didn't all have the same father. And mm -hmm. for me, you know, growing up, you know, that's not a question people really ask you blatantly. You know, mm -hmm. one of my 
sisters in the book, you know, wonder, you know, she's biracial, she's half German. And I mean, we're alike in so many ways, right? People who know us know that we sound alike, we act alike, we joke alike, same sense of humor. And, and all of us are, are siblings. We don't use the term half. And I talk about that in the book. But I did wonder how our family would be judged. You know, it's easy for me to be like, as a 40 year old, like, we don't care, I don't care. Like, growing up, I did care, right? Mm -hmm. I did care. And I did wonder how that would be in the book, how people would see it. Right. And truly, that's not what the story is about. We are mm -hmm. family, regardless of what our family looks like, right? right. And right. we are worthy, regardless of the standards mm -hmm. and the judgments that people put on us, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. my wife did an amazing job of making sure that her daughters, all four of us, are thriving in our marriages, our children are thriving. And that's because she did that, right? Mm -hmm. And the path to change and the path to rising, which I love that opening video, honestly, I want to cry. It's <laughs> phenomenal. But the truth of the matter is, I think that's a lot of the ways we keep women down, right? We mm -hmm. put these judgments on them and we put these limits on them of you know, how neat and tidy our lives should look as mothers and as women. Right. And it's not that, right? And yeah. a woman has a right to be who she is. And I think that's truly what you showed us, mom, is a woman has the right to you know, rewrite her own, her own path and her own story. And my hope, you know, and my hope was that this book would be well received. Doesn't every yes. author and writer yes. want that? It is the yes. best yes. work. That is a blessing. I'm grateful for it. And mm -hmm. I, but I have to be honest to say that I really wrote the book for me, and I wrote it for my mother. That's right. who I wrote it for. And of course, my two year old daughter, who was only a few months old at the time. And when I mm -hmm. first wrote, I couldn't conceive her. I couldn't have her. That it was very difficult to become a mom for me. But mm -hmm. I wrote it more to make sense of my lineage the women in my family, my mm -hmm. existence. That's what my mother's daughter is. The fact that it's now turned into this thing that is embraced by women everywhere and mothers mm -hmm. everywhere is, is, is more than I would have hoped and dreamed, right? Mm -hmm. And I made peace, honestly, Paulette, before the book came out. And this was work though, this was personal work. I have to be okay if just my mother <laughs> reads it or just <laughs> like my editor Bonona and Melanie, they love it, if it's right. just that. And you know, I'm being tongue in, sh in cheek, but I really had yeah. to be at peace with, if it's not yeah. on the best list ever, and it's been on there for weeks, thank God, but I had to say, this is enough. This mm -hmm. is enough, and it has been enough. Yeah, that's yeah. that's just beautiful because, you know, how do you tell your story without being really honest, you know? Um, and and as you're telling your story, you're going through your own journey and and just reading the book, especially at the end, and you kind of explaining the journey you went through to get the fullness of the story, that was also really amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. And and that you didn't get all you wanted, but you got enough. You know, what? really get yeah, there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I think that is the thing like, you can work so hard for something, but you don't get it. But that yeah. was enough. And yeah. it's so funny, like in this interview process, like, you have not read the whole book. No. <laughs> <laughs> <How's that? laughs> I, I read in bit by bit, you know. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. I think her, like my mom was saying, and I did, you know, this was a, a revelation for me, like in doing all these interviews. Uh -huh. Like, I, I think the things are just so close to the service for you, like you still feel them a lot. So, oh, yeah. And yeah. The, we live the parts on the page. My older sister, mm -hmm. Vonette, in the book, if anyone's read the book, you know, Vonette is my older sister. She's okay. seven years older than me. She's not read it either, oh, right? Okay. Uh, it doesn't bother me at all as a sibling. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't bother me at all, but I get it. I think you all lived it. So you know what happens. You know what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need to put yourself through these very emotional and difficult mo moments on the page. And yeah. yeah, it's a reliving in some aspects, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you know, but I, I came from Jamaica when I was 11 years old. Um, mm -hmm. And so I can relate quite a bit to some of the experiences that you had. And you talk about, you know, your your experiences in the schoolyard and things that happened at school and the reaction of your mom. I thought that was just, wow, that's that's a Caribbean parent right there. Mm -hmm. It speaks beautifully also to Kathy's journey coming to Canada as a nanny tied to a host family to ultimately being with her own children. Yeah. Um, so, Kathy, there are many women out there today facing the challenges that you once faced. My mother came in 66. She wasn't officially, uh, she didn't officially come on that program, but, you know, she did that work. That's how we, 
as a family, um, were supported even though we are, weren't all in Canada as yet. So that sort of immigrant journey is really what you went through and what my family went through. And we know that Canada looks to newcomer women to lift our families, um, our communities and economy. So um, what do you think we need to do better to lift newcomer women and their families? Do you have a sense of what we can do? <laughs> Did you feel supported? I don't think you felt super supported by, you know, a lot of the families that you worked for. No, no, I did not, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. I, I remember the first um, the first set of people that I worked for, first thing the child told me, the mate I walked in, that he doesn't like black people. Mm -hmm. mm, I remember that. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. says, and um, I went and told the mom, because he didn't welcome me well. I didn't feel... And how old was he? He was about... Um, Either five or six. Mm -hmm. Yes. And first thing he says, instead of saying hi to me and greet me, nothing, first thing he says to me, I do not like black people. Mm -hmm. There and then I did not feel welcome. I didn't feel love. I didn't feel I I said, Well, if he a little boy mm -hmm. saying to me he doesn't like black people, how about the parents? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know he has to have gotten that from somewhere. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's what yeah. I said, yeah. So I mm -hmm. said well, you know, I said right there. And that's not the place for me. That's really not mm -hmm. the place for me to yeah. work with. I, you know, I didn't feel loved. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, um, and again, Paulette, I think, you know, what readers are understanding is I didn't know all of these stories. How could I? I was mm -hmm. born this month old. So I was mining a lot of these stories that are now in the book. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was struck and astonished at all the things that my mother had to endure. One of the scenes that was really hard to write um, and maybe mom, you can describe it for anyone who hasn't read it, but it's like, remember when I had pneumonia Yes. and you called, um, your work or you asked your worker to drive you. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the same. That's the same, um, family, family that the little child um, he doesn't like black people mm -hmm. that, um, I had Perita, a little baby at, um, at a friend of mine looking after Perita while I am at a place looking after a baby far away, the two mm -hmm. children. Right. And the black stock. And then when um, they called me and said, Well, Perita is not feeling well, but it is very sick that I have to take Perita to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she, the mother came home from work, and then I went to her and I said that um, the babysitter called me and told me that Perita is not fairly, feeling very well, so I have to come to take her to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So she says to me, Oh, I just got home from work, and then um, and I have to go back out. So I realized as if that she did not want to drive me to Ottawa mm -hmm. to look after my baby. So I start crying. I said, my God, I am there looking mm -hmm. after your child. And then mine is there dying. And you're telling me that you're going to take me to Ottawa to go and look after my child. Yeah. So when I start crying and then I have a feeling she feeling shame or pity, then she says, OK, I'll take you to um, Oshawa and take care of your child. And I did, and I never went back to her since. I called her back, and I said, sorry, Kathy, the job is over. Yeah, yeah. That, that's one of the things I loved about you, um, Kathy, is you were so decisive. <laughs> yeah, right, I'm done, I'm done. Like, wow. I am out. And that really was a scene that was hard for me to write and to make sense of, because mm -hmm. I think if you think about the irony that my mother had to leave me with a family that she barely knew mm. in order to help another family care for their child. And when she was in desperate need of their help, mm -hmm. it was too inconvenient yeah. 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 to have my mother go and see about her child who didn't, she had no idea what kind of condition I was in, right? Mm -hmm. I could have been dead and dying, who, who knows? She didn't know. And I think, you know, when you ask about women who come here and newcomers, I think this book really does shed light mm -hmm. on one aspect of what immigrant women go through in mm -hmm. Canada, right? Yeah. And I yeah. think the beauty about womanhood, and I think what is so important, especially even me as a new mom, is for us to understand the plight of other women, mm -hmm. just regardless of our cultures and our languages and our races and where we were born, you know, indigenous women, white women, black women, Asian women, if we can truly I understand the plight of the next woman, that to me is what true allyship is. That mm -hmm. to me is what true sisterhood 
is, right? Mm -hmm. And so I love the fact when I see this book being embraced, even by men, right? Because a lot mm -hmm. of men have mm -hmm. books, they yeah. love yeah. They gifted. I think we are now shedding light on one woman's experience. And if we can find empathy in that, if we can find the humanity in that, that to me is what collectively is going to bring us all together. That is what's going to move the needle. So as we're fighting for, for justice and we are Definitely. fighting for equal footing to mm -hmm. men, like collectively as a group, we're stronger, right? Because we're mm -hmm. not fighting mm -hmm. against each other, right? Mm -hmm. There's room for all of our stories. And so I definitely um, think I've connected with a lot of the people who said, wow, I had no idea this right. was the experience of, of, of black women or Caribbean mm -hmm. women, especially in Canada. And it hasn't stopped. Like this stuff is still going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the other scenes I also found very hard to take uh, was a scene where you were just about to give birth. Um, and I, I, it's it's painful for me to read, to hear. Yeah. Um, and I have a question here from someone who talks about because one of the things that runs through the book is um, your your ability and facility with forgiveness, Kathy. Mm -hmm. And um, someone is asking, I think it's from Barb, how were you able to forgive people who hurt you along the way? Well, like I said before, um, it is not um, the country that hurt me. Um, mm -hmm. Canada didn't do me nothing, to be honest with you. It's just a country, but it's the people. I forgive because I know that so many things we do to God and God forgive us. Mm -hmm. so who am I, I sh that I shouldn't forgive somebody? Mm -hmm. That's what my mom taught me, no matter how hurt you are, mm -hmm. forgive. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Always, yeah. That's what my mom taught me, always forgive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Oh, it, it, you know, I love that about my mother. I do. And I know if she did not have the ability to forgive and forge through, like that was her power, right? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. how she can go on to the next task, right. the next mm -hmm. challenge, the next struggle is her ability to like shed that and let it go, right? Mm -hmm. Because holding on to, I think for you, any of that kind of negativity would have hunkered you down yes. and you had a job and you had a mission. But it's so interesting, right? I have my the other day, my girlfriend Amanda called me. She's like, "Girl," because she's been reading the book. This is my girl. She's like, "Your mother is like <laughs> because I'm telling you that Bruce man, up until <laughs> not see me and my kids, you couldn't do it." And my mother in law, she read the book and she's like, mm, "Damn." Like, <laughs> Readers have struggled with that, mom. They have struggled yeah. with the ability to forgive and look past. And they're like, you mean to tell me this man is still at Christmas dinner? I'm like, yes, girl. He's still be showing up at the Christmas dinner. <laughs> at my table? <laughs> yeah, well, we don't, we don't have the communal table because our family's so big. We're like 30 deep at times uh -huh. before COVID. But my man will be there. He'll fix a plate. He'll be jolly in the room. And that's her doing. And I just, even I struggle about how you can still be so welcoming. The thing is, the thing is, um, when you come from a family that's not mean, my when I when I was growing up, my mom and dad they were such a loving family. Mm -hmm. So I didn't come up from a family that's rough and tough. And 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 my mother and my father they were such a sweet family couple, love loving, caring. And that's mm -hmm. and that's how I up. That's your heart. I never heard my mom swear. I never heard my father swear or fighting with one another. I didn't, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't work that way. So I grew up that way, but unfortunately that I fall in love with a man that abused me and thank God that I'm out of it now, thank you Lord. But you know, that's how that's how I am. I you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I come that way. I yeah. that way. <laughs> well well th thank you for because you're right, Kudita, that is the strength and the power mm -hmm. that you have. And I see so much of my mother, my late mother in you. Um, with all the forgiveness and it's tough as a daughter to to understand where she gets that reservoir from mm -hmm. to be able to forgive. But without that, what would have happened to us as kids? So yeah. I, I get it. I get it. And I thank you for that because we wouldn't have had Perdita as Perdita today um, without that. So I'm going to move on to the next question because we could dwell there the entire interview, but let me move on a little bit. One of the most memorable parts of the book describes how things were not safe at home. So you left for a woman's shelter. 
I really appreciate how the book helps readers understand the challenges women face in leaving abusive relationships. It's the struggle is real, people. It's very real. And when it was described, uh, it's truly real. So the reality is that women are sometimes more unsafe when they leave. And it can take an average of eight times based on studies before a woman is able to actually leave for good because it's so hard. So what, what do you both wish people understood better about the issue of intimate partner abuse and what women need to rebuild their own lives? Yeah, uh, you know what? Um, I think in another interview that we gave you, my mom was asked, uh, and it wasn't prompted or anything like that. They, the, the question it was just open. We were talking about a bunch of things, but uh -huh. I think they asked you, I, I'm gonna ask you if you remember, they said, what was the hardest thing that you've had to do in your life? Do you remember what you said? Um, is I leave my husband. Uh -huh. That was the best thing. Um, it was the hardest thing you The said. hardest thing is to leave him. Yeah, and the uh -huh. best thing. The best thing because, you know, uh -huh. too, too, uh -huh. much, too much. And if you don't leave, the next thing you never know is death will happen. So you just leave and, and go somewhere else and, and, and cool out yourself and then find another life for yourself. And when she and answered, and when she answered that, like they asked like, yeah, what is the, the hardest thing? And I was I was like eating popcorn, like, oh, what's I'm gonna say? Like, I, I never asked her that. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know a book about right. her. Right. And, I didn't know that that would be the answer. Sincerely, I didn't know that that would be her answer. And mm -hmm. I really, truly saw, I'm like, wow. And I, I've never experienced that like personally. I've I'm a child witness to it, but mm -hmm. I haven't experienced it. So I don't think that if you have, if you've ever been under someone's thumb in that way, I don't think you can appreciate just how much fortitude it would take to escape and leave a situation mm -hmm. like that. Uh -huh. And if you've read My Mother's Daughter, you know that when we get there in November of 87, it's called Auberge. Auberge yes. By the time we leave there a few years later, it is now called the Denise House. Uh -huh. you know why it's called the Denise House? Because Denise Penny was a woman. And in my research, I realized that Denise Penny was also um, a woman who stayed at the, at the women's shelter. And in my research, you know, in 2016, she was there when we were there. So our mm -hmm. times overlapped towards the end of 87, towards the beginning of 88. Mm -hmm. It's renamed the Denise house because once Denise Penny had left her husband and she was she finally was able to leave Obesh, she went out west with her daughter, Sarah, and they started a new life. Mm -hmm. Well, her husband, who she had fled and left, didn't like that. He tracked them down and murdered her. The name, the Denise house is in her honor. And it is a reminder of the risks that women leave, that women living in abusive relationships face every day. And yes, it's like you said, Paulette, leaving is more dangerous at times than staying. Mm -hmm. right? And so when my mom said that was the hardest thing I had to do, I was like, oh my goodness, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that would be because, and you know, again, reading the book, we she did leave. Right? Yes. We had a whole little room on Elgin Street. I would learn how to ride a bike. And we had left. And my sister Bonnet was the happiest she had ever been in Canada. And once he came back, which they typically do, we know, right? And they promise you all these things. They'll never do it again. They'll change all these things. And in this, and in, in the book, he promised you this marriage, this beautiful yes. life, right? And my sister, who was around 13, 14 at the time, yeah, 14 at the time, understood like, like no mom you cannot go back to this so that is the thing that women face but i will say this the denise house formerly known as obege is proof that the safe havens for women in our communities work mm -hmm. that there are aspects of the system that do work and mm -hmm. we need more of them because mom that's what gave us a home Yes. It changed the trajectory of our life. Yeah. Everything changed. Yeah. And and thank you for sharing about Denise as well. Um, and why it's named the Denise House, because it's it's very difficult indeed for people to understand. And I think a lot of folks who don't understand, who haven't been in that situation, will say, Well, why don't why didn't she just leave? And it's never that simple. So it's really important that 
folks understand that it, you feel like you're taking your life in your own hands mm -hmm. when you leave, uh, but it's also equally um, dangerous to stay. And so really important that folks understand that. And before we move into the next question, um, Kadita and Kathy, I want to just um, take a moment to make sure our audience knows that right now, it can be more difficult for people in abusive homes to reach out for help. And that's why we launched a new tool uh, last year called Signal for Help. It's a simple one-handed sign someone can use on a video call such as this, Zoom or other kinds of calls without leaving a digital trace. It can help a person silently um, show that they need help just uh, but with a one-handed signal. So it looks like this. You put your hand up to the to the camera to the screen. You tuck under your thumb and you fold over your your the rest of your fingers over your thumb. So it's it's pretty simple. Um, and when uh, folks see that signal, it's it's an indication that someone needs support. And so we ask that you you just basically visit knewoman.org for information about what is the right way to respond? Uh, learn more about the signal for help and, and the appropriate way to respond. So um, it's important, it's a tool in what we need to have multiple um, multiples of in a toolbox when we're dealing with issues of, of intimate partner abuse. Absolutely. So Pradita, you recount an incident of racism on the schoolyard as being one of your first realizations of how you might be seen by others. And then we hear about the courageous stand that Kathy took when she heard about what happened. Yeah. So can you talk about how that experience and your mother's response influenced you in your ways of dealing with racism and, and into the future? Yeah, so the incident is when I went into uh, with two other little girls who happened to be white. I was the only little black girl, you know, at my school. This is around 1986. And uh, it was winter, so we went in there to kind of get warm and hide. And uh, we got caught by the teacher. And she dismisses them and lets them go. But then she takes me to the front of the school, and I have to stand there during uh, lunch, actually, with my nose against the wall. I will I will say this. As I was recounting, I, this this scene and this 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 aspect this this experience in my life has never left me it's been seared into my soul mm -hmm. but i have to admit as i was writing it i'm like did it happen this way like is this the truth like i know it is i know it is but as the grown-up in you you wonder like no no one would do that why would you do that yeah. why weren't we all paraded in front of the school and made to feel ashamed for what we had done right mm -hmm. and so you doubt yourself as a woman you doubt yourself as a writer but I'm like, no, this has never left my soul. I can't, I can't not remember it. And so I wrote that scene as it is. And you know what? I think that I I, I knew it wasn't right what was happening, but I'm five, I'm six, I'm, I, I don't have a voice. And I did always wonder why they weren't paraded in front of the school. I also know that they weren't put anywhere else, right? Mm -hmm. They weren't put in a hallway or somewhere, like they were, they were gone. And I think because they had been at the school longer or she knew their parents or, you know, she liked them, right? They weren't other, that it was easy to say like, oh, this young black girl might have been the one that made you do this bad thing. So mm -hmm. let me punish her and let you go. Don't you do it again, right? And when my mother, I don't, re I didn't realize how courageous my mother was in being like taking me to the school. Uh, and in this instance, when she took me to school, it was because a girl had called me the N word. And when she called me the N word, right? I didn't recognize it as a racial slur. Mm -hmm. I only thought at that time is like, oh, she's rejecting me. She's saying this mean word. I don't know what it means. She could have been mm -hmm. calling me, you know, boo boo head or dum dum head or stinky butt. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't recognize it as this powerful word that demeans. Mm -hmm. and, but when my mom took me, and when I tell you my mother's vice grip, ooh, Kathy, when she holds this, <laughs> you shake you, girl. She pull you out the house, you go. So she took me to the school and she took me in there and she checked that teacher, okay? And now that I have a two-year-old, I get what that is. How dare you? How mm -hmm. dare you? This is my pride and my joy. This is my child. Like, why, mom? Why did you know you had to go there and confront them? Like, what was it in you? The thing is, when you came home and you, you were crying and I asked what happened, you told me that the, the 
the child called you, tell me the name of the person, and he says that she called you nigger. So I just grabbed you by the arm and went straight to the school mm -hmm. because I find that if someone is your friend, that's not the, word, the kind of word that she's supposed to call you. Her friend is mm -hmm. supposed to be your friend. But it hurt me to hear that child call you a nigger mm -hmm. because I was called nigger before myself here in Canada. So, mm -hmm. that, so I had to grab you to the school and then go forward and ask the teacher the question, why that child call you a nigger? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because if I did not take you to the school and, and report to the teacher, someone else tomorrow will call you again. The same little girl will say someone that I called a nigger yesterday and then they'll continue mm -hmm. calling you nigger. Yeah, will yeah, stop. I would not stop. Mm -hmm. so that's why I took you to the school. And I think, yeah. uh, and then thank you, Mom, for doing that for me. I think to all of us, here as parents, um, it's clear that what children are learning and observing and seeing in the home sticks mm -hmm. as young as, as they are toddlers, right? And I think if we as, as you know, women of color and mothers of color have to talk to our children about being called that word and how mm -hmm. to defend themselves against, you know, microaggressions and certain mm -hmm. things, then women who are not racialized, white women, you have to talk to your children about that, right? How not to use those words, how those words aren't okay when they hear their friend using those words in those terms, check it, right? Mm -hmm. you're not, your children are not too young to learn about those things. And I think with this recent, I call it, you know, revolution and racial rising, and it's a beautiful thing to witness in this last year, because I think people are putting on their quality lenses. Mm -hmm. it, I think, um, as, as mothers, especially if you're a white mother who maybe hasn't experienced this or don't know a lot about it, it can feel like really a difficult, uncomfortable place to be, to bring mm -hmm. this conversation up with, the, with your child. But you have to, for the good of your child and the generations to come and to leave a legacy where they're not having to do this work all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to start having those conversations, right? And talking about these things because your child is getting it somewhere. They are listening it to somewhere. Why did this child in grade one know to spew that word to me and at me without reservation? Why did that child that my mom was taking care of, she can walk in the door the first day to live in with them, to take care of them. And the first thing that he says to her is, I don't like black people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Little boy that comes from your parents, that comes from what's in your household, your grandparents, that comes from what's around you. So mm -hmm. your children are not too young to learn how to be allies. Right to learn how to speak up against inequality and racism and, 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 and gender equality. They're not too young. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. you want to shelter them and keep them safe. No, oh, speak mm -hmm. on it because that's right. how it is. Yeah, because those, those are the, you know, that age range, that's the formative years where they soak everything up. And that's why it's important that kids have a good start from that time, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're soaking up everything, right? So it's important that you you can have those conversations because if they're young enough to spew that stuff out, they're young enough to learn that yeah. it's not right, that it's inappropriate, and that it's a big no no. So so you're absolutely right. Um, and you, you know it, it's really interesting because uh, you know you're you're now a woman with a child yourself. Yeah. Um, you're at the age that you are. And this has been a generational thing, and so the, the you know lots of parents, folks like myself, my son, my son is 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 a teacher in the school system, and and you know I had to go through that myself coming to Canada as a kid and being called all of those horrible names or being mocked or feeling as if I didn't belong. So I went through that as well, and then so my mission in life is that you will not do that to my son, right? Mm -hmm. So I get what Kathy's talking about. And you have to protect your kids. Yeah. So I'm moving on because time's going quickly. And uh, this is uh, an amazing, I want to say, delicious conversation. Um, and it's too bad we don't have more time, but uh, <laughs> it's not over. It's not over. Yeah. So we know the pandemic has raised public awareness about the role that caregiving, both paid and unpaid, plays in our collective health. Um, in our safety, society, and the economy at large. And that's why we launched the Mother Rising um, initiative, focusing the video that you saw at the top of our conversation, and which focuses on what mothers and family caregivers are going through and what needs to happen to make things better for them. So, Kathy, as someone who has worked as both a caregiver for children and a personal support worker, 
what do you think needs to happen to better support mothers and caregivers? And it's somewhat similar to the other question around as a newcomer, but you know, we're living in a time where, where um, personal support workers and essential workers are being hailed as heroes. But, you know, we're also seeing that there's some serious gaps there uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how folks are paid or not paid, um, how they're valued and so forth. So what do you think needs to happen to better support mothers and caregivers? Well, um, the best thing for um, to, to, um, to do is when I used to work at the nursing home, how to lift the residents, I sing for them. Mm. I sing for them all the time, although I do get complaints about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know. laughs> Imagine <Yeah>. that. <laughs> yes, I, you know, show them, show them love. Mm -hmm. Show them love and do the best you can for them. Mm -hmm. And what could have done to like to help you to support you? Because you were a frontline worker during COVID, you know. What 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 did you need to get better support? Um, what do I need? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or like anyone else? Yeah, I mostly <laughs> what what I mostly do. I listen to music. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mostly listen to music. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things my mom would say about it, I feel like you didn't feel like you always heard or that they didn't really listen to, you know, the stuff that you all, the support that you needed, you know, to do your work. I remember you always kind of feeling um, bad about that. You'd come oh, home yeah. and oh, yes. not feel like people understood what I, you were going through in, I, the, in the nursing home. I, well, that's it. Um, they're mostly complaining that the joy that I have, the happiness that I have in me, that bothers them, you know, and mostly they go complain that I like I am too cheerful, I'm too happy. <laughs> yeah. I would say I would say that Kathy, perhaps uh, that's one of the remedies for for what we're seeing happening in our healthcare system is that there's a need for more happiness. Um, yes. So, in any case, um, it, it it is it is a difficult thing that we're seeing in society today in terms of the caregiving, and we know how important it is to make sure that folks that we particularly now know are essential to how we live and yes. our safety, and and um, ensuring that we have a a society that is that that the folks that hold us up and keep us safe can themselves yes. be held up and kept safe. But so all I need so, yes. is is the paid sick leave. Like I keep mm -hmm. going on to that. Like it's the paid sick leave. Like if you think about what you know, frontline workers are up against. Like my mom worked in one of the hardest hit nursing homes. You know, you from you're from Pickering, Orchard Villa. Yeah, that was I know. one of the hardest hit nursing homes. Mm -hmm. You know, dozens upon dozens of seniors died, and you know the frontline workers there, right? The PSWs, the nurses they're just not given the true support that they that they need, right? And they're asked to do more with less. And to me, I really do feel like it really starts with, hey, we're gonna pay you for the days that you can't give in, because whether it's your, your, your mental days, you know, your mental health days, or I'm overworked days, those things aren't really given. And I honestly think now our healthcare system, mm -hmm. you know, you know, for senior citizens in particular, like that system is now at its at, at its knees because for years and decades, how many years did you work at the nursing home? Like um, 20, 22 years. 22 years. Mm -hmm. And this is an infrastructure that is underserviced. And now it took a pandemic for us to truly see, you mm -hmm. know, the truth of it all. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't even stop there. It's like the women who are also working in the homes. The other thing too is like, even now, like my mom's path to citizenship, you know, was... I highlighted in the book how difficult that was. But even now, you know, modern day domestic workers, you know, their path to citizenship is, is very difficult. Refugees, like their ability to like help us, you know, be a part of our system, be a part of the society. But then mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what is their path to being, you know, full blown you mm -hmm. know, citizens in our country? It's not a clear path. Yeah, 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 good now, point. But now it is, it is hard for the PSWs now because Right now, sometimes they have um, only two people on the floor, and, yeah. and which is not not, not right. Right. Uh, 
and you have so many residents to look after you have to mm -hmm. do so much for them mm -hmm. and then it's yeah. not nothing you don't have you don't, it doesn't have enough time mm -hmm. to look the way you want mm -hmm. to look after them mm -hmm. and so, and and there and there's the point right there absolutely yeah so i i have a few other questions i'm trying to see if there are any other questions from the audience i'm not seeing any show up on my screen just now and you know there's a question I want to ask you a couple of things i want to ask you Perdita, about yeah. um your, your thoughts around the issue of gender equity and how it's evolved over the years um can you talk a little bit about that yeah mm -hmm. yeah um you know, I think it, we can go everywhere and anywhere with that, and I'll go all over the place. So, you know, bring me in, like, <laughs> if you need to. You know, I have a little girl. She's two, and a lot of, I think my purpose now is really tied to her. Like, I truly want to leave this world for her better than it is now with gender equality. Like, my real house is sport. We know that. Like, that's my point of view. But when it comes to you know gender parity in sport, that's mm. really happening. That's not there. So people are like, well, how do you fix this? What do you do? I honestly do believe it's making noise, right? Being a, a loud woman, right? What did Trump say? Nasty woman. I'll be that. I'll be okay. that. And it's like t-shirt. It's on a t-shirt. Yes. <laughs> I'll say that all day. That is a compliment, sir. Thank God you're gone. Mm -hmm. but it really is about us as women who have platforms and who have opportunities making noise. When you walk through a door as a woman, right, assess how many women are in that room and look back and say, well, who else can I bring into this room, right? I will be hosting, and this is the first time, you know, my own show during, during the Olympics, 12 to 6, you know, mm -hmm. in July, CBC. That to me is a huge, like, platform. Right. And best believe I'm going to make sure that I look around and see like, OK, what other women are doing this, especially mm -hmm. marginalized women and racialized women. That is really important. But here's the thing. The fight isn't over. And I'm you know, I don't want to be a skeptic, but I honestly do believe this is a fight that we have to keep fighting. and We will have to keep fighting even, you know, when I'm gone. Nova most likely will have to take take this fight on. But how do we do it? Make our men you know, allies as well, right? Mm -hmm. They have to be a part of this conversation. They have to be a part of this fight. And best believe if I have a son, I'm going to make sure he's a feminist, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to make sure that he knows that, sir, you have privilege just by being a man and just have, by having a penis, let's be honest, right? Mm -hmm. What are you doing with that, with that platform? What are you doing with that opportunity? Mm -hmm. Which is why I love foundations like your own because we are truly keeping that conversation going. And because we've achieved so much, right? Like since the vote and all that other stuff, it almost seems like, okay, women, like, what are you crying about? Like, what else do you need? Well, we still don't have equal pay. Thank you very much. And for every dollar that a man makes, women are making sense to that. Mm -hmm. If you especially look at sports, again, that's my wheelhouse. You can have a man who's on the NBA, okay? They, they haven't competed. They're, let's say they're injured for a season or two. How much do you make? Still making a good million, some 15 million, 8 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A woman can play an entire season in the WNBA. She may, she might make seventy thousand. She might, and then the other thing too. Let me, let me rant on this, okay? And again, I have a job here, so let me be careful. Mm -hmm. The IOC is now saying if you are a breastfeeding mother, you cannot bring your child to the Olympics mm -hmm. because they're not allowing spectators. They're not allowing international spectators. Now, Paulette, how is a baby suckling at the teat a spectator? The wow. IOC is run by men. Okay, they are completely out of touch. And again, I'm going to try to lie it because they are putting on the Olympics. And like I said, I'm hosting. But the point is, women and mothers still have a long road ahead. A mm -hmm. long say, like I can have my my career is to run a marathon. My career is to be at the Olympics. That's my job. I get paid to do that. Oh, mm -hmm. but I also have a, a child who is six months old. Mm -hmm. How is telling this woman that she cannot? have her child with her. And these are the things that women are still up against. It happens mm -hmm. on the track. It happens in the boardroom. It happens all over. And honestly, this fight for gender parity um, is not over. And I, I don't think it's going to be over for, for my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for saying that. And yeah. I, I, I didn't have to even prompt you. <laughs> like yeah. like this, this, this is what you've lived. And clearly this is what you're committed to and your passion. And there's as you said, so far to go. This is the work of the Canadian Women's Foundation as well. This is why we were created 30 years ago by our founders, including 
the late great Rosemary Brown, um, uh, who was the first black woman to be elected to provincial uh, legislature. So, uh, you know, these these visionaries actually saw the need for us to have an organization like this with women like yourself uh, speaking to these realities yeah. uh, that we that we have to go through. And I can't let this conversation end without talking about your experience at the Olympics. Um, so, um, you know, you had a heartbreaking setback in Athens. You talk about the road to recovery, uh, the practice of writing letters to yourself. I, I loved all of that stuff. You talked about using affirmations uh, mm -hmm. to help deal with the outcome and change your thinking patterns because you you knew that there was some inner work that you needed to do. Um, so I'd love for you to spend just a couple of minutes to talk more about how all of us can use these practices in dealing with our own challenges. And then, um, you know, are there habits that you'd recommend, um, not just in terms of athletes, uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, um, when the going gets tough, is there something uh, that folks could tell themselves? Yeah, I think the beauty of having been an athlete for so long is that it is really just a blueprint for anything. Right. You can apply like the techniques that I had to use to like literally get over a hurdle or get up after falling on a hurdle uh, in any industry. And like you can use it in art, you can use it in science and medicine everywhere. And so it was interesting when I was writing that was one of the last parts I wrote in the book was about Athens because obviously it's, it's heartbreaking and it is till this day for me. Um, and I remember uh, writing that scene finally. And then my, one of my editors, uh, Melanie Titino, she's like, okay, but how did you get over it? I was like, I got over it. She's like, no, but we need to know like the, the yeah. yeah. I was like, oh, yo, you want all that? And so I had to really dig deep into, to, okay, so what did I do on a daily, daily basis? And so I think I have a couple of takeaways that I use, that I still use today, that I think were really lessons for my mother. And it's interesting that, and I, and I say this all the time in my own brain, like the irony of like all the figurative hurdles that my mother had to go through. And then like, she made like a world-class like hurdler, like she had to see that lead leg. She I see it, yeah. <laughs> yeah queen, queen oh, leg. you should, you should be proud of that achievement. Like it's your own. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's like a queen bee herder, right? That's like my super <laughs> queen. And so I think for me, there's a couple of just like takeaways that I use till this day. So the first thing is um, whatever, like, with this Athens, because this is the Athens semifinal. So this is before, and I slayed them in the semifinal. Let me just say, this mm -hmm. is before the final, right? And they don't give out medals in the semis, so it doesn't matter. Right. The point really was for me after this devastating moment was for, for me to feel everything that I was feeling, right? Feel the failure, feel like the, the, the oh, like wanting to like not be here and not even not be here. That wasn't my testimony. My testimony was like, I, I don't know how I can get past this. I don't know how I can, I can get on, right? Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I think that's easy for us to do, especially women, is to like, it's okay, I'm okay. And pretend everything is okay. If your marriage is hard, if homeschooling your children and managing your job is hard, if your husband's work is advancing because he doesn't have to stay home after maternity leave and yours is not, you can feel something, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are things as mothers and as women that we have to give up that you know our male counterparts don't have to. And I think sometimes the bitterness, the the bile, those things that we feel, we are we are told we have to be strong and like hold on to it and move on. No, honey. Feel all of that, complain, have the pity party, call your girlfriend and curse out this person in your mind or out loud. Like, do all of those things because for me, that was a release. Okay. But here's mm -hmm. the thing about, about those emotions you can't hold and harbor that forever, it will weigh you down. And so, when we're talking about my mother and the forgiveness piece, right? If you hold on to that bile and that bitterness too long, it will weigh you down. Where you're going to go, sister, you're not going to go because guess what? You got weight. You got mm -hmm. weight. Mm -hmm. So I think have some time and I give myself the time to, 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 to feel it. Like, mm -hmm. am I, a, am I a failure? Am I a letdown? Oh my goodness. Am I all these things? Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Then the second thing that I did, and this can look different for many people, but for me, I literally wrote a lot of the things down. I faced them all. Right. And I, I call it barbecue that bitch. And mm -hmm. I burned, it, for me, it was a literal, like, Ceremony. I'm like, I'm bringing all this stuff that they're saying. I'm burning these newspapers and they're saying, which I'm burning that. Yes, you're right. Yes. And, 
<laughs> don't be no pyro. Don't burn nothing up now. But <laughs> it could really be like, I'm going to give this a place to live and, and to dwell. And you need to give yourself an outlet. For you, it could be going on your walks. It could be meditation. It could be that little dessert at night or that glass of wine when your family has gone to bed and it's just you, girl. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could be that, but you're really just giving yourself an outlet, a release point to let go of all these things like the burden of your day the burden of your job the difficulties of it to let it go when you let go you you can make room for joy you can yeah. make room for the peace mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so for me it's like all these papers are saying i wanted it too much all these people are saying that i choked i had to confront this and be like okay they're saying that i'm gonna let this go now and i Lit it on fire. It could be your yoga. It could be you and your dog going on these daily like walks and just whatever it is. It could be writing in your journal, talking to your therapist. God knows we need a good therapist, right? <laughs> what I'm saying is you have to have an outlet for all these angst, all these right. difficulties, right? And then the last thing that I did, and this to me is probably the most important and one that I, I got really from my mom and that I employ every day, you show up. Mm -hmm. Paulette, up every day for whatever that task is at hand the way my right. mother showed up every day for whatever the task was after mm -hmm. having a child from the hospital these people had no um no nanny to take over from her just gave birth went to work the same day that she had me for this elderly couple in her home walked up the stairs to take care of the house went on to the next and showed up and here's the thing about showing up you might not be at 100 percent, but mm -hmm. you don't have to be at full power you can be at 50%. You can mm -hmm. be at 10%. But the point is you show up because one day when you do climb those stairs to go to work, one day when you do wake up out of bed as you're doing the work, you will feel more like yourself. That, mm -hmm. that, that devastating moment won't have that same grip on you. Will it always hold on to you? Yeah, right? But that tightness, that vice grip of it all won't feel as suffocating anymore. And one day you will feel like the hurler that you know that you're meant to be. And so mm -hmm. for me, that the takeaway that I take from every day. You don't have to be at 99.99999. You are the father. I'm just kidding. You just have to be who you are every day and show up yeah. because one yeah. day you will be who you are. And that to yeah. me is, is something that I learned. Yeah. Show up. Show up. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a good place to end our conversation today. And I thank you both for showing up today, for <laughs> showing up in the book, for telling this beautiful, heart-wrenching, but also powerful story of overcoming a memoir of struggle and triumph. Yeah. Thank you for being so triumphant and thank you for your transparency, your honesty and sharing the lessons. And, and it's just, I, I just relish this book. Pradita, Kathy, you. you've been amazing. I am so happy that you chose to join us today. And for folks at home, oh, there's one comment here. I can't help but read, Kathy. Why and 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 Pradita, why are you so amazing? That's just <laughs> that's just a beautiful thing. I just wanted to say that. Thank so you. unfortunately, we have to wrap up now. Um, and but you, if you haven't entered the Canadian Women's Foundation Prize draw to win one of these three, one of three amazing uh, books, my mother's daughter. Uh, this is your last, last, final chance. Visit kinewoman.org slash Tireless Readers Collective and enter online now. Our next Tireless Readers Collective uh, event is on June 25th, where we will spotlight Indigenous women authors. So please stay tuned for details on that. And again, please check out our Mother Rising campaign. Um, that video we showed you is also on our website. So check it out and take a moment to fill out the survey. We want to know what your experiences have been, what they are. And, and we, we cherish the feedback that you give us. It helps inform uh, the work that we do. So, so thanks for doing that. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of the day and uh, enjoy the lovely weather wherever you are. Take good care. Justice for mothers. Justice for all who mother. Putting in the care work mothers. Adoptive mothers. Adaptive mothers. Justice for mothers on the Zoom. Those still not in the room. Moms on the front line. Moms working overtime. Justice for the persistent. The consistent. The resilient. the strength 
she carries. Help her rise up. Justice for your mother. For your mother's mother. For the greats and the great greats. Justice for our future mothers. Because when mothers rise, they lift the world. <laughs> 